this class, if we want to go over something again, you have the opportunity to. things in here because I'm not seeing it on this monitor now. They're keeping me guessing today, I'll tell you. So I'll be working blindly. Okay, the top part of the syllabus is an indication of a bunch of different ways that you can contact me. All right, that's the main point of this. And the main point of this is if you're running into difficulty, you should get help and get it as soon as possible. All right. If we don't understand something the first week or the second week, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to go forward into the third, fourth, fifth week. So therefore, if you have questions, get it clarified. You can ask in class for me to repeat something. You can ask during lab. You can uh, see me during my office hours, which I have not yet announced, but I will soon. Uh, you can ask uh, during other classes labs, you're welcome to come and see me during my other class lab sessions, which I'll publish some guidelines and some hours for those. In addition, you can email me questions that you have and you can, uh, you know, uh, we, can, we can chat via Skype if that's the only way to connect. If none of my office hours work, we can arrange other office hours and so on. The point is, is that there's plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions, and therefore I urge you to do it. Asking questions, in asking questions, I sort of the reserve the right to not give you a direct answer, all right? Not to be difficult, but to help you discover the answer on your own, all right? Ideally, if I can guide you to it without telling you the answer, I think that's best for everyone. All right. Uh, it is important to try to figure stuff out on your own, but by the same token, if you spent too much time and you really feel like you're spinning your wheels, then it's probably best to ask. All right. Okay, so that is what we have as far as that goes. Description of the course. This is important. You should read it. This really is our guiding light. This is why the course is here. This is what you're expected to be able to do when the course is completed. Text and materials. Um, there's a uh, how to program a book by Deedle. Deedle, Deedle, and Deedle. Even more Deedle, maximum Deedles on this one. And it has some examples in it, and we'll go over the example uh, uh, projects in there. Some of them are good. Some of them illustrate some good points. Some of them are a little over the top. So in some cases, we may scale down and only look at certain parts of it, certain aspects of it, and so on. Um, so we'll kind of play that by ear, and we'll have other, other examples will be brought in as well. Uh, you should have storage medium simply because remember with the deep freeze and the software that uh, when you reset the machine it goes back to sort of an initial state uh, and all your files will be gone. So do uh, take copies of your work. Instructor approach, this is your class. All right, Let me know if you have any difficulty. There's about 10 people in this class if I'm counting right. All right, which means that you actually need less than 10. Today there's nine. I don't know if anyone, no, no one seems to be missing. All right, so therefore, uh, you're actually more than 10% of the class by yourself. All right, so if there's two of you that have a question about something, and the old teacher adage is if one person doesn't understand it, there's a good chance that another person doesn't understand it. So 
if two people don't understand something, or three people don't understand something, that's between a quarter, you know, close to a quarter or a third of the class. So that's a significant amount of the class. So by all means, ask questions if you run into them. All right. Um, it doesn't do me any good to cover something if no one gets it. All right, so we'll make sure that we do our best to make sure that we don't just cover the material, but that people understand it. There's a whole bunch of policies to cover. Late work, I reserve the right to deduct on late work. But I won't necessarily deduct if I see that this is something that you're working on and you're making progress and you're asking questions. Also, I know that many of you have other responsibilities. So therefore, if you uh, are, are ill and you don't get an assignment done or you have to go out of town for an emergency or anything along those lines, uh, I understand that. And you don't have to divulge anything personal. Uh, just a, a line saying that I have that you have uh, an emergency you have to take care of and you won't be able to get the assignment due on time. All right? That's fine. That's sufficient. The only thing I would say is be careful not to use this policy as a crutch because, you know, you sort of do have to pay the piper. All right? By the end of the semester, you do have to have everything done. And if you fall further and further and further behind, it's going to be difficult to catch up. So my perspective is if you are late on an individual assignment um, for whatever reason, that's okay. No harm. What do I care if you get something a day after I said the due date was? As long as you understand it, that's great. However, if you are habitually turning stuff in late, that's probably a warning sign that something needs to change. And that something could be you devoting more time to the course. That something could be you asking me questions, all right? So therefore, pay attention to that, and uh, we'll make sure that um, we get any questions addressed and straightened out. Here's an approximate schedule, actually about the assignments first. There will be pretty much a weekly assignment, assignment one, you know, one assignment due each week, and uh, then there'll be a final exam that's worth 25 points, and that will comprise your grade. And standard 70 or, or 100 to 90 is an A, 90 to 80 is a B, and so on. And then here's an approximate schedule of the stuff that we will do. We will turn in. Now, I say stuff is due t Tuesday of the week. It's actually due Wednesday of the week. And I also say quizzes online, but we only have a final. So that is a little not up to date. I'll have to make sure. I review this and change it because we only do have the final exam. We don't have any other quizzes. About assignments and about, I mentioned they're going to be due actually, oddly enough, on Wednesday because we don't have class on Wednesday, so that might seem odd to you. Here's my thinking on it. I'm going to do a bit of an experiment this semester, and my aim is to uh, do a better job keeping up on grading, and giving you good productive feedback, all right? And so the idea is that stuff is due Wednesday, which means that you can come to class on Tuesday working on a lab. If you're running into difficulties, you know, I assign a lab today, let's say. So you can work on it today in lab, Thursday in lab, work on it at home. If you come into class before it's due and you have some last minute questions, I can answer those questions. You still have another day to work on it and finish it up and get done what you need to be done. So I think that's a good situation for you. And then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be grading them on the following Thursday in lab. So my grading is going to take place actually in lab. 
all right, which is a little different than I've done it before. I think the class is small enough where that will work. And in that way, I can give you feedback. If you get things done on, turn it on Wednesday, I can grade it the following Thursday. We can sit together and look at it. I can tell you exactly what I'm running into, the problems that I'm running into or whatever. You can see them and you can correct them and you can get good feedback. You don't have to guess what I mean by this comment or that comment. And I think it'll be good. It will, it will keep me on schedule, all right? And it will give you guys good feedback so that you can make whatever corrections you need to. I do ask you even if you are not finished with it to show me what you have so I can see what difficulties you're running into and so on. Questions about this? Each week there will be a module for that week. There's example code for the Deedle book, by the way, that you can download and see the examples that I'm going to go over. If I have any examples other than that, I will, I will post them to Canvas. In week one, I have the fair use guideline, which just deals with if you, if you use images in uh, your assignments or material that is copyrighted, what the law is concerning your usage of it, because there is not unlimited. You can't simply use anything you find on the internet, despite maybe what the public does. All right. So we want to follow the guidelines. And then there'll be the first homework assignment with a Dropbox for you to upload it. The first homework assignment is actually pretty straightforward. We might as well talk about that now before we get into the material in the course. For the first homework assignment, you only need to run a program. All right. So, what I want you to do is, and we'll go over this, and we'll actually try to do this. I want you to import the tip calculator uh, app. And the tip calculator app is um, one of the Deedle apps. So, you import that then I want you to show me some things. I want you to show me the app running on the virtual device. So build in the Android Studio, which is the main application we'll be using for developing in this, this, uh, this uh, course. There is actually a, a virtual device or emulator. So you don't have to have an Android device to run and test your code. So I want you, after you've downloaded and imported the tip calculator app, I want you to show me that app running on the virtual device. And I want you to do it simply by taking a screenshot of it. So, it, you know, you can do this as five different JPEGs if you want. Uh, you can create a Word document and paste all the JPEGs in them. Doesn't really matter. Just when you're done, you'll have five screenshots. So the first one is a tip calculator actually running. The second is I want you to see, I want to see the main XML file in graphical layout mode. All right. We'll talk about these files again today and we'll sort of move you in a direction where um, some of these things will make more sense to you. I want you, I then want to see the code for the main XML file. The code for TIFF Calculator Java and the code finally for the Android manifest. These are all different files that are part of the application. I just want you to bring it up within Android Studio and take a screenshot of it. All right? Although, again, you can do these labs in the lab room. It's probably a good idea if you use your own laptop with Android Studio for that. So that's my recommendation. Any questions about this? Okay, what I want to do now is 
I want to create a simple, real simple Android application and I want to spend some time showing you the pieces of it. Alright. One thing that is allows for a lot of power in Android is the fact that things are done as components. There's components for everything. There are components for the UI. There's components for the constants that you use, like string fields, things that you're displaying on the screen. There's components for them. There are components for a lot of things. This adds to the power of the Android system. The fact that your program isn't just one giant blob of stuff. All right. There's a bunch of pieces that work together. However, that also can be very maddening because it gets to be confusing of what's and where, how these things work together, and so on. So really, my first job in this class is to take and create just the Hello World application, all right, and then we're going to go in and we're going to make sure that um, we, we start to understand what's in each part and the purpose of it and how they work together. So let me go in. I'm going to start Android Studio. Okay, this is weird. Here is Android Studio. I'm going to go in, I'm going to start a new Android Studio project. I'm actually going to pick an empty activity. And an empty activity really isn't empty. There's still a lot of stuff in it, but it's it's pretty empty. They, they, should, they should have that up there as a caption, a pretty empty uh, activity. So you can see there's other kinds of activities. We might get into some of them, but we're going to start with an empty activity. We can give it a name, my application. Let's call it Welcome to CISS. 264. All right. And notice it uses that as a default for the package name. All right. Many of you probably remember from Java, towards the end of Java, we talked about separating your code in the packages. All right. And this is simply creating a default package for your, um, for your uh, Android code. Notice the package names use sort of the reverse URL uh, notation. So mine has MikeZellers.com, but it's reverse, so com dot MikeZellers dot and then package. Save location is telling where it's going to put it. In my case, it's going to put it in the desktop. Uh, in a folder called Welcome to CISS 264. The language. Defaulting to Kotlin, we're going to change that to Java. Didn't notice that. Minimum API level. I'm picking API 15. 
In other words, Android, like everything else, has different versions that it goes through from the beginning till now. Uh, the minimum API level is sort of the lowest, the earliest version that will be able to run this particular application. Keep in mind that if you go too far back, there'll be features that you can't use. So you don't want to go too far back. And the default that they give you here is 15, so we'll just stick with the default. And that tells you, gives you information, this app will run on approximately 100% of all devices. Well, that's pretty good, all right? We can click on this to say, help me choose, and it will tell you if, for example, I picked 15, and that's about 100%. If I picked it would run on API version 23, that would be 62% of all of the devices. Well, I don't know, that's just a little more than half. That's not really that good. So 15 kind of covers all the bases, so I'm pretty comfortable leaving that. They give these clever names to them as they progress down the alphabet. Ice cream sandwich, jelly bean, Kit Kat, lollipop, marshmallow, nougat, Oreo is the latest one. What do you suppose the next one will be? Ten. Okay, ten. And what was what's the name of it? Do you remember? That, yeah. That is. They're, really, they're going away from them. Oh, they are? They're going away from those names? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm going to kind of miss them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to click finish. And what that will do is that will create... I don't think there's any more questions. They'll create an app for me. It actually switched screens for me. So let me drag that back over. All right, here you go. And actually when it creates the app, it creates it with a bunch of files that we can see here. And we'll look through these in a minute. We can actually run our blank application in the emulator and see what it looks like. If you go up to run and say run app, it will bring up a test, not a test, but a, a virtual Android device and we'll bring it up in it. If you're doing this for the first time, you might have to go through a procedure to initialize a Android device. Okay, again, it brought it up on my other screen, so let me bring it over, and there it is. So this is a blank application. This is meant to be an Android device with my uh, Android controls. And so like down here is like the home button on an Android device. So that would correspond to the home button on the Android device. This corresponds to the back button and this corresponds to, I think, brings up a menu of stuff. Recents. Pardon me? Recents. Recents, okay. Title and a little message there. So, for the first part of the assignment where it says download the tip calculator and run it in the emulator, that in a nutshell is what you have to do. Run it, take a screenshot of it, save it as an image. All right? So I've ran it. Again, this is an empty app, so it doesn't do tons of stuff, but it gives you sort of an empty palette that you can go and you can create your app on if you want to. Right. Okay. Well, well, we'll see where it comes from. Okay. All right. It generated a number of files for us. 
And in one of them, it slipped in the word hello world, all right, simply because that's sort of a standard in computing for the first app that you write. But we'll see where that comes from, and we'll see how to change it. And we'll notice that shame on them, they didn't do this right. All right, we'll notice that. That's something that always bugs me, but hey, they probably make a lot more money than me, so I'm sure it doesn't really bother them that much. Okay, let's look at the different files. All right, I'm going to sort of give an overview of the files first, then we'll drill down and look at some of them in more specifics. Now, we're not going to look at all the files today. We're just going to hit some of the highlights. First file you have here, and it's in the Java folder, is a Java class that handles the main activity. All right? An activity essentially is a screen that you're presenting to the user. So that's an activity in a nutshell. So an app typically will, comp will contain at least one activity, right? Because you're going to run the app, something's going to pop up to the user. Now other things might pop up, right? You might have multiple activities, an activity to do this, an activity to do that. But simply put, you're going to have at least one activity with an app. And this is the main activity. And it's a Java class. Again, you can either use the programming language Kotlin for this, or you can use Java. We're going to use Java for this. All right. Notice that there's not a lot in this activity, but we will come back to it and review what it does in more detail later. But this is kind of um, the boss that runs the show, right? The main activity. It's the Java code, and it fires up when the app starts and does what it needs to do. Next thing we're going to look at is under RES. RES stands for resources. All right. Resources are where you put extra files that the app uses to do its job. Drawable would be where images would be. What is that, Mike? Drawable. What is what? The um, folder you just named. Drawable. There's actually an XML file for the launcher background and the launcher foreground. Interesting, right? It doesn't look like a graphic. It looks like code or XML, well, it looks like XML code, which was what it is. Does anyone know what this kind of graphic is called? I think I heard it. Vector. A vector graphic. A vector graphic is where you don't have an actual image file, like a JPEG or a GIF or a PNG. It's where you sort of have instructions to do something. The big advantage of vector graphics is that um, because they're instructions, they don't lose their resolution as things get bigger, right? So this is actually describes effectively a drawing. It has a background and a foreground. We'll leave these for now, though. But I do want to introduce them. The layout. The layout for the screen is done in an XML file. And you can do the, show the XML file two different ways. One is the design view. I think I called it the graphical view in the assignment, but this is what I mean about showing 
the page. But then there's also the code. So this describes the things that are on the screen, and it describes it via XML. This shows you sort of graphically how it looks. Can you, how did you get between the two? Just click the little thing right oh, here. Oh, okay, got it. Here are icons for this app. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. And in here are values. These are places where we're going to store constants that are going to be used throughout the application. For example, the application name. All right. If we look in the strings file, there's a string for app name. And the app name is welcome to CISS 264. All right. Now. What's the significance of doing this? Why do you think we put constants in a separate string file? So that if you change it one place, it will be reflected everywhere else. Exactly. It's, it's a practice that we do so many different times in programming. We take and we put things by themselves so that we have one place to change it if it changes. All right? So, if, let's say this, this, is, this is a small app, remember, and there's only one screen, but let's say there were dozens of activities and dozens of layouts and all that, and each one of them displayed the name of the app. Well, if the name of the app changed, like it did so many, a couple years back when this, the numbering of this class changed from 265 to 264, right? If we built that in every screen, we'd have to go into every screen and make that change a dozen times or five times or whatever. And it'd always be the risk that we'd forget to change it somewhere. So any constant like that, any string constant like that, we can put in this resource file so that if we change it here, it gets changed in the application. So. Let's say, gee, this doesn't look exciting enough. I want to add some explanation po exclamation points. Welcome to CISS 264. All right, we're excited about it. Now if I go in and run it, Welcome to CISS 264. Fortune, unfortunately, made it too big. We got too excited, and it scrolled off the top of the screen. But there you can see it went and actually changed that. Now, it did not actually change the application name that's stored that you created in the beginning. It just Right, it changed the, the application display. title being displayed, correct. Okay. So any constants like this are going to be put in this file, and so we can ensure consistency. So we're never going to hard code a string in our layout. We're going to use a string constant to have our string 
constants in the layout. So let's see how the layout uses this. Are you all familiar with XML, at least some degree? All right. XML is a markup language, just like HTML is a markup language. And you use tags to indicate things. Now, the difference between HTML and XML is HTML is written for just one purpose, making web pages. XML can be used for any purpose that you define it for. And in this case, um, the tags, the, the purpose for this is to define constants. So you have a tag that indicates the beginning and end of your list of resources. And each constant will be as part of a string tag. There's a name attribute that says the name of that string constant. And then between the start and end of the string tag, there will be a... Um, there will be a, um, the, the value of the, of the string constant. So the value of the string constant is between the start and end string tag. Welcome to CISS 264. So let's look at how the layout file uses that. If we look at the layout file, should make this bigger. If we look at this, stand corrected. It's not in this layout file. But let me show you what I mean by the fact that I don't like the way it did the hello world. You had asked where the hello world is. Hello world is here. There is a text file, or I'm sorry, a text view item that's part of the layout. Again, the layout is also in an XML file. And in the case of a layout XML file, you don't have string constants. You have the different components that you can put on an Android screen. And one of them is a text view. And the text view has a number of attributes. Some of them control the layout and how big it's going to be and so on. But one of them is the actual value of the text field. And in this case, it's hard-coded hello world. Okay. That's not good, right? Because what if we add that hello world greeting a bunch of places in our application? We'd have to go and change it a bunch of places in the application. The better thing for us to do would be if that was in the string layout file. So let's go and do that. Let's go and put in a string constant for greeting. Change that from app name to greeting. And I'm going to change that to hello class. Okay? So I changed the greeting to hello class. Now, all I have to do is tell. the main layout file, to use that. How do I do that? That's a good question. Think it like this. Let me Google it.
Now if we go and run this, the message says hello class instead of hello world. So remember that, that their example actually didn't really practice what they preach because that greeting, you should never have a string constant in a layout file. You should always refer to a string constant that exists in the strings file. Now there's an interesting another reason for that. All right, it's great to have string constants, right? Because again, it, you're gonna call things consistently if you have a string constant file. You're not going to call it one thing in one place and one thing in some place else. So you refer everything to the string files, uh, the string constant files, and you ensure consistency between uh, all the times that you use that. Um, so if you have your address, if you have your company's address, let's say, in a string file, if you have company name, company city, company state, company zip, company street. If you move, change it in one place and your entire application is taken care of. There's another reason why having stuff in a string file is beneficial. Anyone want to guess that? Why is it a good idea to have your strings in a string file? So everything's in one place. So everything's in one place. That, that's a good idea. But besides that, what if, you're, what if you want your application to work not just in the United States, but other places? If you want it to work in Mexico, in Germany, in France, in Iceland, in China. How do you think a string file would help you there? You can just change the string files to the different Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You can have a different string file for each country. All right? So you don't have to go and change your program. Your program stays the same. You just have an additional string file, one for each language that you want to support. And Android is smart enough to know which string file to use. By default, it uses strings. If you're in France and there is a strings underscore fr, it will use that one instead. Uh, it's all based on like two digit uh, um, language codes. All right? So Spanish is probably S underscore sp and so on down the line. So you can very easily, you don't have to go through and change your code or translate it. You just swap out the string file. And in fact, all you have to do is define the string file. And Android is smart enough to look at the language of the device, because that's one of the parameters on the device, and use the proper string file. Yes? That's what I was going to ask. Could you tell it just to use the device default language? Well, you, 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 that's, that's the great thing. You don't have to even tell it that. It's going to use, it's going to look for the, the string file that corresponds to the default language of the device. Right. All right. And if there's a string file for that, it will use it. If it doesn't find that, then it will use just the plain old string file. This is, these are called resource qualifiers. And I don't really want to get into them today, but essentially all you do is to have multiple versions of this file that simply has, instead of being called strings, it will be strings underscore something. Strings underscore fr, strings underscore um, sp, and so on down the line. Strings underscore de, and so on down the line. And you don't have to do anything in your code to say, hey, use the default language. The Android operating system does that just on its own, automatically. Now, 
we're going to learn other resource qualifiers because there's resource qualifiers for language that say if your machine is, if your device is this language, use these string files. But you can also do it for the size of the screen. If it's a big screen device, like a tablet, you can say use these things. If it's a smaller screen, you can use these things. All of these things are accomplished pretty much the same way. They're accomplished by having multiple versions of these resource files. All right? And they contain extra stuff as part of the name. Like I said, underscore FR for France. If it's a bigger screen, there's going to be an underscore something else to indicate use this on a big screen. And you can even combine things. If it's, if it's in France and it's on a big screen, do it this way. All right? And so on. That's getting a little ahead of ourselves. We want to make sure we understand how these work before we start understanding using alternates for these. But in a nutshell, the str, or strings file, is used to store string constants, and those string constants can be used in any of your layouts to specify stuff. Okay? Now, the other two layout files that automatically get created for you are a styles and a colors. This defines the primary color as the thing in the colors file called color primary. Color primary dark, color primary accent. So we could go and change the colors of these things simply by going in and changing them. So let's, let's go for the heck of it and let's change. color to, I want to make sure it's real obvious, so we'll make it green. Let's make this red. Let's make the accent color blue. this layout doesn't use the accent color at all, so that's why we don't see any blue. Where are these things referred to? They're referred to in the layout file. No, they're not. Again, that must be just a default that will, oh, yeah. No, they're not. It's not referred in there. Okay. So, let's review what we have so far. And I understand if it's still a little vague, all right? We'll go over other examples of this, but I want to sort of drive home the main points of these. We have the Java activity file. That's the boss that runs the show. We have a layout XML file that says what the screen is going to look like. It does it with an XML file that describes how the controls are laid out as well as the individual items on the control or the individual controls that are, that are part of the screen. Then finally, we have these constant files where we can define colors and string values. And these all work together to make for the application. Now let's look at the Java main activity. 
Java main activity doesn't do much in this case, right? Because all we're doing is displaying a screen. So, when we create the activity, when the activity is created, this happens. So we call the ancestor uh, on create because, again, the, the Android framework for activities uh, contains a lot of code, a lot of superclasses. So we're going to make sure the code in those superclasses run. So we call super on create. And then we say set content view to our layout activity main. Resources layout activity main. And that's what connects this activity to that particular XML file. Whoops. That's what connects this activity to that particular XML file. The fact that we say make the activities content view that layout. So then that XML file is used to create the screen that we're going to see here. Let me look at the time. What time do we have? We have 6.17. Is that right? I'm going to see if I can download and bring up the tip calculator example. That's one of the things that you need to do. Would we be able to find that example online, Mike? Because uh, my book won't be in for at least another week. Find which example online? The uh, tip calculator. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So okay. I'm going to download it. If you go to where he has download and click on it, it brings it up to a mode that you can download without having the book or anything. Okay. And it lets you do the download from that screen. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. I'm in Canvas. Here we go. Hope this doesn't take too long. How much Java is actually used in this class? I mean, it's Java. Fair bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm in your okay. Java class. Yeah. Uh, one, am I going to be okay in this? Um, you've done C Sharp before, so yeah, you should be. That might be something maybe maybe you'll need to review some things before we cover them in class, so you can always ask me to clarify. But a lot of this class is not just like, how do I want to put it? A lot of this class isn't just like writing tons and tons and tons of Java code. It's like using functions that exist in the Android framework. So knowing the Android framework is uh, important too, and that, that's what we learned in this class. So the countdown is on. Your PC is fast. Okay. 
it downloaded to my desktop. I am expanding the zip file. I know what I did wrong. Let me see if I can fix it. I, I do this in this classroom once a year, every fall, when we teach Android in here. And I'm looking at these cables thinking, I don't know why I'm not seeing the screen in front of me. Because it honestly is literally a pain in the neck. All right, not just the expression, because I have to crane my neck to look up at that screen. <laughs> I pulled the wrong plug. I should pull this plug. And now I have it in front of me. All right, that is a relief. See, this is why you do things in class, like download and unzip a file. It gives you time to sit back and reflect. So I was sitting here looking down like that at the cables. It's like, I plugged in the wrong cable. So I didn't think they changed anything in here, right? I mean, normally they don't change anything with regards to that. It is still unzipping this, so this takes, this takes a while to unzip all this. All right, so here we go. We look in there, there'll be a list of the examples. I'm gonna open up the tip calculator one. So, I'm gonna go into Android Studio. So I close out of this one. Instead of saying start new Android pro uh, project, which is what I did before, I'm going to say open an existing Android Studio project. Click that. I'm going to look on my desktop, which has the Android examples. I'm going to pick the tip calculator. Click open. And it's going to go do its thing. and it opened it. And it actually can go in and Processing. It does, yeah, I'd say it does some processing when it, is, when it first loads an application. Okay, I'll click OK. Yeah, there we go. If it asks you to upload something or update something, update it. I mean, that's my only advice here. Um, it does get a little confusing. It is a little bit of a, also a, a bit of a pain in the neck, but you just kind of have to do it.
I'm concerned about the machines in the lab is their performance. I don't know how good their performance is on Android. suggested for you today would be to make sure that you have Android uh, Studio installed on your machine, uh, your laptop, uh, or machine at home, or whatever, and be able to do what I did. Go in and create a simple, empty application, be able to run it, see it in the emulator, change the, 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 the app's name if you want to, change the hello world to use the string file. If you can do that, you're in good shape for today. Um, not sure why this is chugging, just it must be taking a long time to load and all that. When you finish, is this going to have you update all that? Too? Okay. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to kind of do this with you, but it's sort of the end of the class. Uh, next class, I will probably go to, well, I will. I'll go through the uh, Deedle welcome app and uh, and uh, we'll do um, we'll work through that and we'll do sort of the same thing of finding the different pieces of it and so on. I might not have to do that because I already had Android Studio installed and I, I probably went through this like last semester or, or last fall or whatever so but still it's sure taking its good old time. Will we be using the lab in this class? You're welcome to use the lab in the class but I, I think it's better if you use your own laptop or your own machine. So if you have a laptop, that's probably the optimal thing. You can bring it to class and then uh, bring whatever questions you have um, to lab, and we can address it there. Okay. Uh, I guess that's all for today. We kind of timed out on this. Um, we'll pick this up on Thursday.